Good morning, grandkids. Well, if the maintenance guy's out in the hall, we'll stay quiet long enough. I'm going to try to get a short vlog finished. Well, I don't know how short it will be, but I only have two things to do on this vlog. The first thing I want to do is show you about these. Uh, this company, Kamura, sent me these earbuds to try which thank you very much guys I appreciate it um they're even pretty they don't just have black nubs on the front of them they it's all pretty red cherry glittery so that makes them nice and It takes, for me, it takes a little bit of messing around with to try to get them just right and tightened around my ears enough so that they're not going to be pulling out. But other than that, I like them. Uh, the sound is seems just about the same as if I had them big heavy headset, headset on. And this is less cumbersome. And... The headset had gotten to where, over the years, I've worn them so much, practically all day long, and it really had started bothering my ears. I believe I said something about that, and that's why this company, Chimera, sent me these, which I appreciate so much, guys. So this is what they look like, and... This is what they're like when you take them out. Now, it has a headphone uh, mic on it. Man, that you can... What can I hold this so you can see it? <laughs> that you can use. But I use my big mic stand, so I don't use it. So I turned it down so it's less viewable. And you see how these are bent. And, the, and that bendy part is quite movable. You you adjust these into your ears, over over your ear, and into your ear. Well, see, I have to I have to mess with them. Uh, it's not as easy as just sticking a headset on. <laughs> In your head get them poked in your ears and then you can work on adjusting this to get it tight enough to stay fit okay but they're really good once once you get them on <laughs> it's just me I'm a grandma and it's difficult for me to do some things I suppose okay I'm gonna take them off because I don't really need them to do a vlog but I did want to show them to you. Thank you guys so much. And that is Kamura Solo in in ear headset. And they're pretty. I like I like it because they're red and glittery. I'll bet they have colored ones and I'll bet that they sent me the red ones because they've heard me talk so much about the fact that red's my favorite color. Okay, the next thing I wanted to do I wanted to get back to this uh, letter that I had gotten. And I, I showed this to you on my previous uh, blog, I believe. It was a previous one, or else it was the one before that. But I was telling you, and I read you her letter and stuff, and showed you her cardinal that she drew for me. But the thing that I hadn't done at that time was read you the story she said I'm not going to read you the little uh, one page short one I think she did that as an exercise in a class or something I'm going to read you the story that she wrote and that she sent me and and she drew me all kinds of little pictures on it all through it 
So let's start. The name of the story is called Down by Bar Barbara Plutaka. I don't know how to pronounce your last name. I only know her as Hervisa in my comment section. Hmm. Evidently, the person who is supposedly telling the story says, all of her letters start with the same phrase, esteemed Udo, I am still alive. I don't know who. Hmm. This person who's writing the story or who's telling the story, not Hervessa, but the person in the story is, to, is called Nice, I think, N-I-S. I got a little confused in reading it as to who is who, but she did put certain things that was said in A different font and I don't know if that is the person that's writing or the person that's writing to the person that's writing so I guess we'll see maybe I hope okay esteemed Udo I am still alive there's a thick bundle of them notes like the letters safely hidden inside my rucksack See, I don't know who this is that's talking right now. Is it Udo that the letter was sent to? Or has he, has Udo accumulated letters from somebody? So, why am I standing in front of a mine that had been shut many years ago, staring at its large iron doors? Because the last letter had been sent almost two months back, and since then, not a word. The only clue I have is this labyrinth of deep tunnels mentioned in passing in one of her missives. So the person who writes to this person is a female, and I don't know yet if this person is a female or a male. And then in, in italics again, 20 years ago, they suddenly put a stop to all their mining activities and swept the records under the rug. That's what she said in reference to this mine. I know was never one to sit idly by. Now, is I know the ones writing to her, I guess. I know was never one to sit idly by and watch the clouds pass overhead. Her mind always found something to focus on. These last few years, apparently, that something has been the Inger family. Maybe Ina is the one who wrote the stuff in italics, I'm not sure. The Inger family, whose enormous mercantile empire, however, spanned infinitely more interesting industries than mere mining. What then could have drawn her here? Yes. Officially, the thick iron doors are there for the safety of possible wayfarers. Unofficially, their purpose is to protect the investments of the mine's owners. Financial insecurities of faraway businessmen were obviously of no concern to Ina herself, though, because one of the thick wings of the sturdy gate is bent inward. The twisted, singed edges of the resulting hole suggest that her infinite affinity for explosives remains as strong as ever. In italics, they were hiding something, that's for sure. So did she break in? 
And then the writer says, And what are you hiding, Ina? What secrets were you afraid to commit to paper and ink? I shake my head and head on inside. After squeezing through the damaged door, I find myself in a spacious stone hallway. What little light comes from the outside is enough to reveal sturdy metal railway tracks set in the middle of the floor. I pull out a crystal from the holster on my belt and hold it in my hands for a moment where the warmth of my skin touches its smooth surface. The living mineral slowly starts to glow with a pleasant greenish light. Satisfied with my improved lighting conditions, I stride forward, noting the gentle downward slope of the stone hallway. There are some side tunnels here and there, but a closer look reveals they are but empty alcoves and spaces probably used as storage rooms back when the mine was still active. Humans would surely expect an abandoned mine to be full of debris and littered with trash, a forgotten pickaxe here, an empty chest there. Dwarves know that's utter nonsense because proper mining requires proper equipment and keeping careful stock of your tools is a great way to avoid unnecessary expenses. I stick to the main hallway and keep walking until the light of my crystal reveals a metal structure hiding in the dark. A rusty mechanism, thick chains, a loading platform big enough for two mine carts. I lean over the edge of the elevator shaft and peer into its depths. But I already know I'm not going to waste time trying to bring the colossal machine back to life. It doesn't look like Ina or anyone else has been using it recently, so neither shall I. Here's another picture that she drew a mining car cart. Smaller hallways branch from the main tunnel on both sides of the elevator. I'm quite certain all the roads meet again somewhere in the depths of the mine, but just to err on the side of caution, carefully inspect the stone walls of both hallways. Aha! Jackpot! At the beginning of the left branch, there's a small angular symbol carved into the rock, roughly at waist height. I nod to myself, a hint of a smile on my face. I know was always a meticulous one. So she carved an emblem there so that when this writer came to find her, she it would be helpful. I set out again, the floor sloping ever downwards. Can you guys hear that creeper running out in the hall? I'm sorry if you can. The hallway twists like a snake going down, down, down. My steps echo in the darkness, but I hear nothing else. After a while, even this tunnel starts branching out every now and then, and Ina's carved symbols become more and more complicated. I check every side tunnel and every cul-de-sac, but the carvings remain the only proof of her presence. I feel like I've been walking for hours when finally, finally, the tunnel opens into the main hallway again. I would never admit such a thing out loud, but seeing the railroad tra tracks leading from the distant elevator fills me with a strange sort of relief. If getting lost was Ina's plan all along, she really could have picked a more pleasant destination. The thought is a half-formed joke, honestly, but I cannot help but mull it over a moment longer. 
than in italics again. You might be the only one I still trust, you and Tio. Sometimes I catch myself watching everybody around me and wondering, who among them is it? Who spies for the angers? Who was sent by niece? I think this is niece that's writing this. Or I don't know. Who knows about the white square? No, this is something time cannot heal, cannot erase. Be careful, my friend. Now it's back to the writer. It's not paranoia if you know that they're after you. And ghosts of the past have a rather unpleasant tendency to rise from their graves when you least expect it. I sigh wearily. I can talk with Ina at length once I find her, if she is willing to share, that is. I inspect the huge tunnel and discover not only alcoves set in the walls at regular intervals, but also several big hallways branching at right angles from the main road. Man, I would get so confusing, confused in a place like that. My inspection becomes even more thorough, and my frustration steadily rises as I attempt to figure out which of the tunnels I know used. I have to assume that certain combination of symbols mean she explored the tunnel and went back to the main one, Otherwise, I would have spent an age down here, running from one branch to the next. And I finally discover an entrance to a side tunnel that is marked only by a single carving. My knees are complaining loudly. I'm quite sure they disagreed with the dark descent right from the start. Poor knees. I give in and surrender to their threats, sitting down in the nearest alcove. I pull out my rations and eat in silence, illuminated by the soft glow of my trusted crystal. <clears throat> Every metallic clink of my travel bowl echoes strangely in the looming darkness. It unnerves me somewhat. Sleep pulls at the edge of my consciousness the effect made all the stronger by the crystal lying on the floor next to me, dimming slowly without direct contact with my body heat. I see no reason why I should resist resting my eyes for a while. But before I do so, I hide the crystal back into its holster. Force of habit. If you can't see the enemy... At least make sure they can't see you either, as my old sergeant used to say. Time passes. An odd feeling dispels my dreams. I open my eyes and immediately sit up. It takes a considerable effort for me not to let out a startled shout. I am no longer alone here. Barely two meters away from me, there is a stranger, a dwarf, squatting on the stone floor and staring at me. The lower half of his face is covered by a thick beard that has most likely never felt the touch of a comb in its life. I can make such observations about my watcher only thanks to the light of his of his, thanks to the light of his arms. His wrists and forearms are covered with small crystals that illuminate the dwarf's face from below, casting eerie shadows over his rough features. The white scars crossing his skin suggest he was the one to adorn his extremities in such a fashion. Why would he do that, I wonder? Before I can react to his presence, he speaks out. His voice is coarse and rusty with disuse. What is it? No, not what. It is a who. It shall become what? 
once it stops breathing. So, who is it? It isn't her. The air is too fresh. Do you live down here, in this mine? A foolish question, perhaps, but when talking to someone whose worldview differs so dramatically from your own, caution is the key. Down? No. They all went up, up, up. This mine is mine alone. Now to undermine. Yes. The stranger nods his head. Shut the door. Shoo the light gone. And there is somebody here, isn't there? Or at least there was, recently, in the last days or weeks, perhaps. Days? I continue, saw carefully. No, many days. Many, many days since they were here. Time runs differently underground, even if you are considered sane by the rest of the world. I'm looking for a dwarf woman named Ina. Oh, Ina's a dwarf, too. She came here looking for something. Short hair, many tools. Tools, tools. Oh, and ho, oh, deep down we go. We've got our gear, nothing to fear, the dwarf hums. She sings along, holds the tune. I sit up straighter. So she is still here? Mine, barks the dwarf suddenly. My words, mine, cannot hear me through the doors. She is silent. The dwarf wildly turns his head left and right as if listening for somebody's step in the darkness. Then he quickly pulls down the rolled-up sleeves of his leather miner's coat, instantly hiding the crystals on his skin. My eyes have barely gotten used to their pale glow, so the sudden return of the all-consuming dark blackness blinds me temporarily. I reach for my own source of light, but by the time my crystal starts glowing, the stone alcove is empty once again. Fantastic! There is a mad miner hiding in the dark somewhere who could turn out to be both a promising source of information and my possible murderer. The unexpected encounter chased away all traces of sleep, at least, so I get up, grab my things, and head into the marked tunnel. I can only guess where the demented dwarf has gone to, since my steps are once again the only thing I hear. I keep following the inconspicuous markings on the walls. After passing several branching points, I start adding my own. I feel like Ina is leading me deeper and deeper still, and then I turn a corner and come face to face with an imposing, tall stone door. Their surface is covered with writing, large symbols, all speaking of danger, dwarven runes, common tongue, the scratches of goblin kind. And just like with the mine's entrance, not even this obstacle could withstand the determined force of dwarf-made explosives. Evidently, that door, door is half torn down, too. I carefully strike a match and light my small candle. The flame flickers merrily, its color unchanging, even if there were any dangerous gases behind the stone door. Enough time has passed since Ina's forced entry that the atmosphere on both sides has apparently reached, reached an equilibrium. And I want to show you the pictures on here. Here's the dwarf with his sleeve pulled up and the glowing crystals on his arm. And here's the candle that she just lit. I'm assuming it's a she. <clears throat> but the dark tunnels of the deep can harbor other dangers than just the unseen kind. 
other reasons why somebody would shut them off. I move the crystal to my left hand and check that my knife is safely sheathed within my reach. Cautiously, I make way through the defeated doors. <clears throat> Gotta get more hungry or something. Through, the, what did I read? I make my way through the defeated doors. Yeah, they must be broken or something too. And I find myself in an enormous underground cave. I just am not comfortable. I'm sorry, grandkids. The walls are so far away that my meager source of light would have no chance of reaching them. But it matters not, because they themselves are a light with a soft glow. Complex formations of crystals stretch from floor to the ceiling arranged in complicated patterns I can appreciate properly only because I'm standing at such a distance. It seems, though, that unlike my own piece of living mineral, these crystal clusters do not require external source of heat to shine. Their greenish muted incandescence pulses slowly, brightening and dimming at a steady rate making me feel like the stone itself is undulating all around me. The floor is surprisingly smooth, but strange stone structures similar to stalagmites rise up here and there, never quite reaching the ceiling. I cannot see the end of the cave, though I'm sure it hides in the darkness beyond somewhere. Suddenly, the air is filled with hissing, rustling of hundreds of leathery wings. Tiny pinpricks of light start shining above my head, more and more of them spreading out like ripples on a pond, until I feel like I'm standing under a sky full of stars. I raise my crystal a bit higher, and the darkness recedes, revealing the small scaly bodies of cavern dragons hanging upside down from the craggy ceiling of the cave. It sounds like, sounds like bats, but they're little dragons hanging from the ceiling. And she drew a picture of those. The glow of the crystals adorning their backs brightens and grows as the colony awakens and the animals turn curiously towards the source of the unexpected disturbance. I feel a smile tugging at the corners of my mouth. I haven't seen such a large group of these in a very long time. So the person that's writing this knows about these small dragons that hang from these cave ceilings. I step cautiously forward. S something crunches loudly under my boots. The sound echoes through the vast cavern like a whip crack. The dragons panic, dropping from their roosts, and in the span of a few seconds, the cave is full of beating wings and hissing shrieks. It's like standing in the eye of a small, but all the more dangerous, hurricane. This one's got teeth, after all. I force myself to stand still waiting for the colony to calm down. Most of the flying lizards eventually return to their rocky perch, but they keep their tiny triangular heads turned towards me. Only a handful of dragons flies away into the unseen parts of the cave like miniature garments. She drew a picture of one of the dragons. And he's got all the sparkly things on his back. I, ex I exhale slowly, curious to see what spooked them so much in the first place, and turn my gaze down to my feet. 
It's the cracked remains of a the biometer. I don't know what is that what that's going to be. Before my heavy boot ended its life, oh it's something living. In such a violent fashion, it was apparently well used and for quite some time. I don't know if it's something living or not. If the scratched metal and replaced screws are any indication. Maybe it's a mechanical beam. Such a machine costs a small fortune, which means its owner definitely wouldn't leave it lying here voluntarily. Which means... Mm, I walk carefully forward, try to illuminate the dark nooks and crannies of the vast stone floor. I come near one of those strange stalagmites, or stalagmites, stalagmites, I think, and I spot a leather boot, still laced tightly on somebody's foot. My grim assumption begins to take a more tangible shape. I walk around the stone structure, and there, next to a damp recess, hollowed out in the ground, lies a body. Her body. I exhale slowly and wearily. She has been the only thing on my mind these last few weeks, as I've followed her trail like a loyal dog. And now my search is suddenly over. I kneel on the ground next to the dead dwarf, and I feel empty, without a purpose. Ina had held her sturdy bag close till the last breath left her body. I open its metallic buckles and start going through the bag's contents. Although there's not much actual content to speak of, several schematics, some hastily scribbled notes, a few smaller tools that wouldn't fit inside Ina's many pockets or the various pouches and holsters on her belt. But that's it. And, and she drew uh, a tool and a parchment roll. I like these little touches of drawings that she added to her manuscript for me to see. Is the explanation for her journey deep underground, hidden somewhere in her papers? Or will it forever remain shrouded in mystery? Only now do I notice the tiny crystals growing on what little bare skin there is to see on Ina's body. Her wrist, her ear, her nose. Guided by an unsettling, morbid fascination, I reach out with my hand and touch the mineral. Immediately it starts glowing softly. My mind offers me a glimpse of Ina's last moments, her body covered with crystals that slowly, surely lose their light. Well, there's nothing Ina shall say to me now. I get back to my feet and throw one last look around the enormous cavern. Although I'm certain this place was what Ina was searching for, my task is finished. I turn back towards the stone door. There's nothing else for me here. Somebody else can try to figure out what secrets these dark halls hold. Time passes. The trek back to the surface is much faster than my careful descent. Once I leave the mine, it's only a day's journey to the nearest inn big enough 
or a mail coach to stop by. I step inside, and the delicious smell of roasted meat fills my nose. How marvelous to be back in civilization again. I sit down at an empty table, wave at the innkeeper to bring me a mug of ale. Then I pull out a sheet of paper, a quill, and a travel inkwell in my bag and start writing. Here's our mug of ale. And this is what she wrote. Sir, my search is finished. Ina shall say nothing to no one now. I would recommend sending a larger team into the mine. I'm returning to Heiger, H-E-I-G-E-R, to deal with the last complications. I've already taken care of Udo, so only Tio remains. With the respect you are due, Nis, and I S. So, this all sounds nice near the end, but I think some skulldudgery was going on. Melissa, what I want to know is, I hope this wasn't the end of this. I hope you're writing another chapter, and I hope you send it to me, please. I want to know what's going on with them, and who everybody is a little better. But it's very clever. I think it's cleverly written. It's just me that was hard for, I'm sure. Thank you very much, Odessa, and I'm looking forward to getting some more of it. I hope there's more. All right, grandkids, I hope you enjoyed that, and uh, I hope you enjoy my looking at my new earbuds. And thank you, Kamira, once again, for sending those to me. And I will see you grandkids all next time. So, bye for now.